Okay, we should get going. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Bill Thompson. I'm the uh, director of an IAM practice at a company called Unicon. I'm the builder. Um, with me uh, is Dave Ashi from uh, EMC. He is the defender. And Aaron Weaver from Pearson, and he is the breaker. Um, we've got a, a cool presentation for you today about how we've applied um, OWASP resources to an open source project called CAS. Um, here, here, who here has um, open source deployed in their enterprise or their company or works with open source software? Okay, just about everybody, right? Um, how do we know open source is secure? Is really the theme of this of this, project, of this uh, presentation. So uh, we're going to talk about um, how we applied OWASP to an open source project called CAS. This is a web single sign-on system. Uh, been around for a long time. Um, simple, flexible, extensible open source web single sign-on for the enterprise. Um, it's, a, it's a great platform. It's got, uh, been around for a long time, has um, out-of-the-box support for a ton of applications that you're probably familiar with, and for every sort of major platform, framework, language. Um, I like to say that there's a, a CAS client for everything from ASP to Zope. Um, it was initially created at Yale by Sean Barron in 2001. Um, and initially got a lot of deployment in higher education along with um, a, a project called uPortal, which was an open source portal for higher education. Um, can't really have an enterprise portal without web single sign-on, so CAS was really uh, critical of that deployment. Um, I was at Rutgers uh, in the early 2000s when we had deployed uPortal in CAS and uh, the original Yale CAS, and we're, we're very happy with it. Um, Although uh, the initial CAS was a little bit monolithic, and, um, and essentially everybody, uh, every deployment was essentially a fork of the Yale CAS. And so um, at Rutgers, we had a lot of experience um, and enjoyed working in a community aspect um, and really wanted to be, have a, a, a dynamic like that around CAS. And so we, we called our friends at Yale. We went up there and told them what we were interested in doing and, and some plans that we had to extend CAS in, in different ways, and they thought that was a good plan. And so that, that launched a project in 2005 um, to recast uh, CAS as a community project under uh, the JSIG, which is a, an Apache-like foundation for higher education research, uh, open source projects. Um, and so the, the project's been around for a long time. Um, it's a simple protocol, flexible architecture, and it has wide deployment. Um, but is it secure? Well, um, well, we think it is. Uh, CAS fundamentally is based on Kerberos. It's had wide deployment. It's been around for a long time. Um, we don't know of any exploits out there in the wild. Or there haven't been any sort of real uh, reports about it. Um, we have start. We w did start to see um, reports in the community around um, dynamic scans from time to time. Hey, we see the open redirector or this you know JavaScript injection or something. And those those have been closed. Um, but we got to thinking that you know maybe we should maybe we should really check <laughs> check if this system is secure. Um, and so in the beginning of last year of this year, um, we we spun up uh, what we call the CAS AppSec Working Group. And again, this is an open source project, so the participants were sourced from the community, and they included core committers on the project, deployers on the project. And, and, and thankfully, and we were, and, and gratefully, um, you know, AppSec information security guys uh, from deployers uh, like Aaron. Um, so these are the folks that have been participating, and basically we've ha been having uh, biweekly calls and, uh, and been doing a lot of work uh, figuring out whether or not uh, we could trust CAS is secure or not. So these were, these were the goals that we came up, kind of our, our charter for the AppSec working group. Um, we wanted to proactively improve the security posture of CAS, not just wait around for vulnerability reports or, in, or incidents. Um, we want to be able to respond to potential vulnerabilities, so people do from time to time say, hey, this, is this a vulnerability or this isn't working for us? Can somebody take a, check, take a look at that? Um, we wanted to produce artifacts to allow potential adopters to evaluate the security of CAS so that we could answer the question, is it secure? Well, we think it is, but... Here we, have, we have actually have done some work, and here are some artifacts that you can prove to yourself whether it's secure or not. Um, and then we wanted to maintain and create recommendations on, on deployment practices. Um, so the software may be secure by default, but um, the deployment may not, right, because maybe you made bad decisions. So we wanted to have some recommendations about you know, how to harden the deployment. And that's really what we've been up to for the last, uh, the last year. And um, Aaron's going to talk a little bit more about how this fits in with OWASP and, and AppSec. 
So just about a year ago, uh, Bill came to me and said, hey, you want to join uh, this CAS working AppSet group? And I said, sure. Um, and, and one of the cool things about it is uh, we use the CAS product um, at my company. And, and so now being able to be part of an open source project um, and actually contribute to security in the project is really awesome. So um, w you know, one thing I, I throw out there is that, hey, if you're not, um, if you would like to give back and you're, you're a security guy, uh, consider joining uh, an open source project. So you know, the question is, there's a lot of open source projects out there. How do we know they're secure? And I know there's various vendors out there that are trying to um, prove to you that you know, open source or just any product has a secure, is secure. Um, and, and you can see more attention being paid to it. I think this is partially Google starts to pay for um, improving source code, uh, partially because of the Snowden uh, releases, um, and we want to go back and look and see, hey, are there any backdoors in there, or, or what's exactly going on? Um, but, it, but obviously, we're at a security conference here, so we know application security is important. So now we need to drive that into our open source projects. So I think in some ways, um, maybe open source should also, I mean, obviously should be open about the software security vulnerabilities that they have, right? Um, and, and work to fix those and remediate those issues. Um, I think a lot of projects that I've seen, there's some that are really doing it really well, and then there's some open source projects that uh, they don't have any sort of application security working group. So, you know, one of the, the, the questions uh, that we have is, you know, when you're looking at an open source project, at least from my standpoint, from the security guy's standpoint, he wants to know, hey, how secure is this project? Are, are they doing source code review? Uh, do they do dynamic scans? Um, security architecture, when they actually architect the application, are they, are they looking uh, for the, the, making the correct design decisions at the beginning? Because obviously we know building security in at the beginning is where we want to be at. So does that open source project do that? And, and I think if you can position your product or your, your, your um, project that way, that you do security, you do it, here it is, here are the artifacts that I produced out of that, can be a fantastic selling point for your project. So security really can be a selling point, because I don't, you know, I've used open source projects in the past, um, quite a number of them, and it was like every other day somebody found some flaw in it, and, and most people don't want to be around patching their products all the time. You want there to be a base of security built in. So, for example, you know, it could, security can detract from your project. Not to pick on WordPress, but you know, this is just one example of you know, WordPress has a lot of vulnerabilities. They're very good about fixing those issues and, and remediating, remediating them, but um, part, partially because of their popularity. But we don't, you, you don't want to have you know, your product, your open source project in the news all the time because there's a vulnerability on there. Um, recently, uh, at the beginning of this year, I think, or actually maybe it was uh, in June or July, uh, a researcher went around and looked at Moodle. He just picked, you know, some of the open source projects that are out there, and uh, he saw that he just found within two weeks' time he found a, vulner a particular vulnerability. And so then he went and asked them, can you fix this? And it looks like, you know, four of them decided not to fix it, and three of them decided to fix it. And you can see from the downloads there, there's quite a number of people that have downloaded this project. And so now you're in a state of you've downloaded an open source project, you've adopted it in your enterprise, and there's no patch for it. So what are you going to do? Well, in some cases, maybe you can deploy a WAF, but really you want to fix it in the project itself. So that brings me to this point. You know, OWASP, um, just in 2013, released the top 10, as we're all, we're all well aware. This was a particular sticking point for some people. Um, as far as should this be in, shouldn't it be out? But I think it's important to, to, to emphasize that um, we rely, obviously, on lots of components. And so, for example, CAS is, is, is built into a lot of uh, products out there overlaid as, or as an authorization platform. And for us, we obviously want to be secure. And so this A9 component, I think, is very important for our project because it's like, hey, we can point to this and we can say, here's what we're doing to remediate those issues. So just some of the suggestions that I have that we've seen in our, in our project, you know, if you're an open source project, is, is start a working group, meet on a regular basis. Uh, the OWASP resources have been very valuable for us. I mean, we've used those quite a bit. Uh, 
meet regularly and also use technology, right? So we're using either WebEx, Skype. It, it really helped us to be able to see each other in person. I thought it sounds a little silly, but you know, if you can see the video of your other person, like I, I haven't, this is the first time I met these guys in person, but you know, I wasn't able to identify them because I've seen them on video before, right? Um, so those kind of things really help. Um, you know, make it easy to report vulnerabilities. For example, you know, you should have, um, you know, a lot of companies now are, are, are pushing, hey, you can disclose it to us and we're not going to prosecute you for that. So make it easy, if you find a vulnerability, to take those in. And then, um, you know, David's going to talk more about this, is doing threat analysis. And I can tell you I was always a little bit of a skeptic with threat analysis, but David's changed my opinion on that fact and he'll go into that and what they discovered there. Um, and then we also were running different security tools. Uh, there's a great ZAP project um, that I know that um, the, the, the project leader is here. And I think he already did, maybe he already did his presentation, but I would suggest to go to that one. And then just doing static code analysis as well. So for one thing, for, for contributors, if you're contributing to an open source project, uh, you know, I recommend, like I said, use OWASP resources, threat model, and work with security researchers. If, a, if, if somebody sends you a vulnerability, don't just discard it and say, hey, I think that's stupid. Um, look into it a little bit, because a lot of times, sure, there's some that are, that are you should ignore, but a lot, oftentimes a researcher has valid concerns. And if you work with that researcher, um, you know, you can either have him delay, uh, you know, full disclosure, or you can say, hey, let's work at it, let's put it into the project plan, let's create a bug ticket, and let's actually fix that problem. So here, here's just a screenshot I took, um, not of ours, but um, just as an, as an idea, there's lots of ways to do it, but have a, have a way for people to report your vulnerabilities. Make it easy so that if your project, uh, if somebody finds an issue with their, your project, they're able to report it. Um, we did do static code analysis, and I also did a little bit of, uh, I did do dynamic uh, analysis on this. Um, static can always be a little bit noisy, but um, I would recommend, you know, it's one of those things, do you recommend it or do you not recommend it? And I say, yeah, we, we recommend doing all of those things. So do dynamic scans, do static scans. And, um, you know, we found a, a couple issues, and uh, we actually worked through those, prioritized them, and, and worked through remediating those. So it's very beneficial to do those kinds of things. It'll also help you find, you know, silly, stupid stuff that you should fix. So now I'll hand it over to David to go through threat analysis. All right, thank you, Aaron and Bill. Um, <clears throat> so I'm David Osi. I work um, at EMC Corporation. Um, and uh, EMC uh, does a lot of uh, closed source software, um, but we do leverage open source software, and one of the products that we do leverage in a number of places in EMC, in more than one product, in fact, I, as I move around and talk to different groups within EMC, I find more and more that use it. We do use this um, uh, for authentication, for uh, single sign-on and ticketing. As a ticketing engine, we use um, CAS, the project we're talking about here. And so I got involved in, um, uh, you know, not just as a user, I try to get involved as a a supporter and, and uh, you know, actually looking into the code itself and um, changing, updating the protocols for things that are useful to us. So as a result, um, I went to the um, Aperio conference where um, CAS was being discussed and uh, I think it was Bill or, uh, got started with this idea of a, we'll have a, an application security uh, working group. And one of the nice things about working at EMC is that um, we have, uh, in part because we own uh, RSA, um, we have a very uh, strong um, group um, that supports application security. It's called the Product Security Office, and um, they have uh, a, a lot of resources um, related to um, a lot of resources related to doing um, making sure that our applications are secure. One of the things that, long story short, one of the things that got drilled into my head from that experience was the notion of doing threat analysis as part of of not guaranteeing, but um, opening up uh, whether opening up and finding out about your application and where the security holes are. Um, so uh, I can't, uh, as I joined this project, um, I couldn't share the EMC resources, but what I found is that the OWASP resources around threat analysis and other, uh, other types of uh, um, application security um, uh, advice is, are very rich. Okay, and so um, just by using the, utilizing those resources, we were able to, to get started on this project. Um, so the starting point really is that um, when you ask people, as Aaron said, 
when you ask people about, you know, is CAS secure, um, and you talk, especially if you talk to committers, they'll say, well, of course it's secure. You know, I didn't introduce any security bugs. What, you know, I know I'm writing, I'm writing a code for a, a authentication engine. Why, why, how, could I, how could it be that I don't know about security, right? Um, and that actually was, it, you know, I didn't, when we got started, I don't think we had anyone, you know, saying, oh, let's not do this. But I think people were a little skeptical as to whether we would find anything. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I introduced the notion of, um, of threat analysis as I had experience from EMC. And basically what threat analysis is, it gives you a way to systematically analyze um, the threats, the possible threats against your system. So rather than just saying, you know, sitting in a room, looking up at the ceiling and saying, well, I don't think there's any threats, I don't think there's any problems with our system. Let's, let, is there a way that we can actually look at the system systematically going, up from, going over from top to bottom to find out is that actually, is your assertion or is your intuition correct or is it not correct? And of course the chances are it's not completely correct. If you actually look at the system, you're gonna find things. Um, the other thing that threat analysis does is, so the outputs are, the input is your system and you're, and you're anal trying to analyze it in a systematic way. We'll talk about exactly how that works. Um, the outputs are you have possible threats. You have things that could go wrong with your system, right? Places where your system could be attacked. And then once you have those threats, you're going to do things like, you know, analyze how, how bad the threat is and what you're going to do about mitigating it. But the other thing that threat analysis does is it actually gives you an output that, that adopters of your project can use, right? So if you have a, a product that's being embedded in other products, um, the adopters, if they want to implement your product, um, in a secure way, they have to understand something about the way the thing, act, your product actually works. Um, and I'll show examples later on about how that works. And when you do threat analysis, you dec decompose the application in a way that you can actually let adopters understand deeply something about your application so that they can figure out if they're doing things right or if they're actually breaking your application by the way they deploy it. So, okay, so what's the methodology? So the methodology is that basically um, the first thing you're gonna do is um, we're going to decompose the application, okay, um, into parts. And there's different ways of doing that. I mean, you can do it. There's textual, uh, text-based ways of doing it. Um, you can, you know, you can write paragraphs about each component and, and such. Um, the way that, um, again, I learned in EMC and it's documented well on the OWASP website is to draw a data flow diagram. And I'm going to show some of those in a, in a moment. Um, when, you, when you decompose your application into a, uh, using a data flow diagram, what you're going to see is you're going to see all the possible places where um, data can flow in and out of the system. And if you think about it from a security point of view, if you want to attack a system, you have to attack it at some attack surface. And any attack surface is an input or output point to the, to, to the, uh, to the program that you're analyzing. So this is a very good way to find, uh, this is a very good way to um, begin to systematically find places where vulnerabilities could exist, where threats do, could exist, okay? Once you've identified, you've decomposed the application and you've identified basically what the attack surfaces are, then you actually want to enumerate the threats against each attack surface. And for that, what you're going to do is rather than again sitting and looking at the ceiling and trying to, trying to guess at what attacks could be there, you're going to use something like a threat library or some methodology that gives you um, a, a systematic way of enumerating the possible threats against your system. There's a bunch of different ways of doing it. Um, in this particular case, I'm going to show you we use something called Stride. But again, if you look at the, um, if you look at the uh, OWASP website, they give you many different uh, possible methodologies that you can use. And then having gotten to enumerate all those threats, and then, I'm sorry, I, I left off ranking them, right? So then, now that you've discovered a threat, um, you want to rank, you know, how, how important is that thing? Um, and there's a number of ranking systems that you can use to um, determine that some of them are more formal, some are less formal. Um, having ranked the, the threats, you know, identified them and ranked them, you want to create a, a list of mitigations, right? And then from that list of mitigations, you can do, make um, conclusions about what you want to, uh, you know, what you actually want to do with your project. I'm going to actually show some examples of that and make it more concrete. So all this stuff that I just talked about is on the OWASP website. There's a, there's a, there's a couple pages um, that describe um, threat modeling. Um, I have a link to one of them here. You can go and just search for threat modeling and you'll find there's a couple of pages. There's some overlap between them. It's worth reading all of them and you can decide based on, that, on what you read what methodology you actually want to use. Okay, so what was our experience? Um, basically what we did was we started with a uh, whiteboarding session. Okay, it was actually at the Apirio conference. This was really a good thing because again, you're trying to analyze your system. You're trying to analyze what threats there could be. There's no one person that fully understands the system well enough to be able to do that himself, usually, him or herself, usually. 
Okay, I mean, this, you know, even even if you have the super expert, right? He's got a certain point of view of the system, um, and for you know, to take the simplest example, the coders of the system and the adopters of the system are going to have two different viewpoints, and having all of them in the room together is a useful thing. Okay, and so we got started with that. We got started with uh, just a whiteboard where we drew actually drew uh, data flow diagrams. I think I came in with one I had drawn for my EMC experience just as a starting point to demonstrate. But then we just got up on the whiteboard and did that. And we produced an initial data flow diagram and started, you know, looking at threats. I think that also got people interested. They, they got people saying, oh, wait a minute, you know, this, this methodology might actually do something for us. Um, after that, we kind of followed up biweekly with, um, with uh, WebExes. Um, so we, again, we kind of bring, we have a whiteboard, you know, we can just, you know, a shared, uh, you know, virtual whiteboard. We, we see um, together what the diagram looks like. And we can actually, we have on the side, we've got our little threat methodology we'll talk about in a minute, our threat library, and we say, hey, what attacks can you imagine that happened on this part of the system? We enumerate them, and it's it's interesting what you can uh, uh, what we can um, brainstorm when you got a bunch of people together on the phone. Um, as I mentioned, we use Stride to help identify the threats. I'll show you what that is in a moment, and then basically just took the results and put them up on a wiki page. Um, again, as I mentioned, I mean part of what we want to do with the wiki page, part of the part of what we want to do with the output of this is to enumerate threats so we can we can find what we want to do next on the project to try to mitigate them. But some of it is just so that adopters can be uh, more confident about the security of the system and also what they have to do to make sure that the system is secure when they deploy it. Okay? So, okay, here's a bit of a mess. So what we started off with, and, and I, 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 I advise people to do this if they're doing threat modeling. This is my experience. It doesn't sound like a good idea, but it actually is. So the first thing you do is you do a context data flow diagram. Okay, so let me just point out a few. I'm just going to point out a few. Um, I have a more, uh, don't try to, you don't have to try to read the, the, the lettering here. It's too small. I have a better diagram in a moment with more details. But just to show you the, the kind of elements on the diagram, this diagram actually doesn't have all the elements of the data flow diagram. Um, but this is a, a process. Um, the double circle means it's a complex process. It means that, you know, CAS itself is actually composed of many other processes inside. So if I double click on this, it's not going to do anything, but if I double click on it in, the, in, the, in my mind, right, I'm going to notice that inside of CAS there's many different uh, processes. So that double circle indicates a complex process that can be further decomposed. These other uh, boxes are kind of external processes that interact with our system and give inputs and outputs, right? The arrows describe a data flow, right, data flowing in, into CAS, flowing out of CAS. And then the annotations on the arrows tell you what kind of data that is. Um, and then finally you've got You've got these little um, uh, boundaries here, which are kind of uh, privilege boundaries, or sometimes they're called, or sometimes people use them as security controls. Um, and what I've done here, and this is not the entire picture because trying to put the entire picture would be completely unreadable, is we did this context data flow diagram where basically we took, we envisioned and imagined the, the CAS system as one black box, right? One complex process in the center. And we basically categorized the inputs and outputs, um, all inputs and outputs um, uh, that we could think of to that process, in and out of that process. Okay, now, you know, you're not going to get a very good understanding of your, of your uh, application from something like this, the internals of your application, but you're going to take, it's going to give you a good way of looking at your application from the outside, and it's going to give you a different perspective on the application and where it can be attacked. So even though, you know, when you look at it the first time, it's kind of like, you know, like it's too much stuff on the, on the page, right? It actually is, I find it is actually a useful thing to do, and I advise people to, to start with it. Um, what we did then next was we, we, bro we broke things down into a little, more, a little more concrete detail. So here I'll go through a little more, I'll just go through a little more detail so you can see something that we did. So here's the cache server, okay? Uh, which is basically the, the single sign-on engine. That's where the, the user logs into. He logs into that and he um, uses that to um, uh, exchange his credentials. It could be credentials, it could be a, you know, a username and password, it could be a certificate, it could be um, a ticket from some other external system, it could be a SAML token, whatever it is, something that's going to authenticate the user. Um, he gives it to CAS and he exchanges it for a, um, exchanges it for a, either a ticket granting ticket or, or, or a ticket granting ticket and a service ticket which are used for further interactions, okay? So we see there's flows of data. There, there's a flow of data in, username and password, and um, also the, the URL of the, of the application so that um, we can put an audience restriction on the ticket so that the ticket is only valid for that application. Um, and then we get back 
this data, okay? We have a boundary here, right? So we've got from the browser to the CAS server. We're running over HTTPS, okay? Uh, we, we try to make sure that that happens. Um, and of course, you've also, got, you've also got the username and password as part of the security boundary. Um, down here, um, so this is an internal process. This is part of CAS. The browser is an external process. I don't really control the browser, so I put that in, a, in this uh, rectangular box. Um, the browser also interacts with the CAS agent or client that sits in front of the application. Now, I, I don't have all the arrows. I just, I'm just, this is a partial picture just to demonstrate the, the idea and the technique. I, there, obviously, there have to be arrows between the CAS client and the application. I just don't have them in the picture. The picture would have been too busy. But um, again, you can imagine the browser um, coming up from, uh, you know, having uh, logged into CAS is going to bring to the CAS client um, a service ticket um, to enable access to the application um, and is going to be making an HTTP or HTTPS request. And this is a problem already. You can see a problem right now, right? Because if it's an HTTP request, um, someone might be able to steal that service ticket and use it for something, right? So we've already got a potential threat right there um, that actually came up and we, we talked, we discussed that. Um, and then coming out of this, uh, you know, agent is, is basically, um, you know, some response to the request and uh, a session cookie, you know, which could have been established based on um, trading in the session ticket, uh, the service ticket for a, for a session cookie. So this is the kind of, um, this is the kind of an, uh, analysis that you're going to do for a data flow diagram. And again, if you enumerate every single arrow in and out, then you've enumerated every single interface that could be attacked, hypothetically, right, if you do a good job. And you can then take every one of those interfaces and try to figure out, is there a threat there? Okay. So the next step, okay, is actually taking some kind of threat library. Again, you can do this without, you can do this in an informal way, but it's better to do it in a little bit of a more formal way, right? So um, this is, Stride is kind of a general, um, you know, a general threat modeling mechanism to try to identify threats. There are more specific lists of threats that you should be checking for if you're doing a specific kind of application, like a web application. And if you go to that OWASP website, you'll find um, different methodologies. But the, but the, the main, the, the commonality is that there's some systematic way of enumerating the things to think about. It's not a replacement for thinking. It's not like a template you're gonna just drop onto your application and you're gonna find what the threats are. But rather than trying to just go in your head and trying to figure it out, you're trying to find a systematic way of looking at it. So this is one systematic rendering of, of the possible kinds of attacks that can be done in your system. So, um, and then again, on the OS, you'll find this table on the OS website with more um, better description of what each of these threats are. They wouldn't have fit onto the slide. It wouldn't have been useful to put them here. But if you go on the OS website, you'll find this, this table annotated better. But basically what you've got in this, uh, in this uh, particular um, table is the different kinds of threats that you have and the different kinds of security controls that you need to apply in order to mitigate those threats. So there's two different ways of using this table, right? You can kind of look down and say, all right, is there a way that um, someone can, um, uh, you know, someone can tamper, you know, use that interface and inject data and tamper with my system such that um, the data in my system is, is no longer has integrity anymore, right? And that's one, that's one, one kind of uh, a way you can look at this thing, right? Or I could say, you know, is there a way that someone can use this interface to grab information that he's not supposed to have, right? Information disclosure, okay? And then the other way to look at it is to say, you know what? I'm gonna look at it from the security control point of view. Do I have, what kind of authentication do I have on this input, right? What kind of method do I have for keeping confidentiality of the data through this input, right? What, what mechanisms do I have to maintain availability on this input, right? So I can look at it from the threat point of view. I can kind of look at it from the defense point of view. And again, there's other lists of, there's actually, I believe if you look on the website, I don't remember the methodology, but there's actually a methodology that kind of reverses this. It takes it from the defender point of view of make sure, enumerating all the different kinds of defenses and making sure that I have every single one of the possible defenses that I would need to secure my application available at that interface. Okay, so I put together, I had the data flow diagram that again is one methodology to identify all the different attack surfaces. I've got the, my threat library, so to speak, that, you know, that I can use to apply to the, um, the inputs um, to those attack surfaces. Okay, so what do I actually get? What does the threat look like? So here's one that we, we actually did discover through, um, through a, you know, a threat analysis. Um, in this particular case, what uh, it was, um, we put it here under the category of information disclosure. Of course, it's a little ambiguous in the, in, our, in the case of our system, it's a little ambiguous. If I have an information disclosure attack on an authentication system, I'm also inherently kind of susceptible to spoofing as well, right? Because if I can steal something which is 
credential related or ticket related or what have you, I can then use that to spoof. But in this case, we categorized it, we could have characterized it as, you know, information disclosure, um, but we instead we, we, because immediately it was a, it was a, um, it was a, uh, um, if, um, uh, it was, we could have, excuse me, we could have categorized it as a spoofing, spoofing attack. We categorized it as an information disclosure attack because that was the immediate attack vector was to get information that uh, the user should not be able to have, the attacker shouldn't be able to have. So basically what we found was that um, there's many, there's a couple places in the system, as you can imagine, these tickets that we hand out to users, um, we don't want people just getting their hands on them, right? Okay, if you have a ticket, if I get trade my credentials to, I get go to CAS, give CAS my credentials and get back a ticket, um, then I can use that ticket for nefarious purposes, right? So I don't want, I don't want to uh, enable that disclosure, that's pretty obvious. Um, and it turned out that in certain places in the protocol, um, it had to do with uh, the proxying protocol where um, A authenticates to B, and then B wants to act as a proxy and authenticate to C on behalf of A. We have cases like CAS supports that. It turned out that in, 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 uh, in somewhere in that protocol, there was a, there was a place where uh, B, this proxy, was talking to CAS and exchanging information with CAS using an HTTP GET and where the ticket identifier was actually in the URI as a query parameter, okay? Uh, now, there's no browser involved here, so no, there's no shoulder, sh shoulder surfing uh, possible in this particular instance because it's happening machine to machine, but um, that's, that's bad practice, right? I mean, if you look in the, the HTTP spec itself says don't do that, okay? For example, any, ki any kind of server, um, you know, web server uh, logging that's used for traffic analysis or that kind of thing. She's going to spit those URIs right onto a file which is readable by people who should not be, you know, who are not the identity of the person who owns the ticket. Um, so that's really a bad idea. Um, you could get an index in, in, uh, in, in internal search engines or who knows what. Um, so this was something that we got to because we re-examined the protocol. We looked at the attack surfaces and said, what kinds of attacks can be done there? We wouldn't have necessarily seen it otherwise. You could argue, well, it was a bad design decision to begin with, of course it should. But the point is that you're going to have those kinds of things in your system. That you are going to have them. Unless you systematically go look for them, you're not going to find them. Well, you'll, someone will find them. It just won't be you. Um, so in this case, what was the mitigation? The mitigation is, okay, well, you know, don't do, you know, the first mitigation was, you know, CAS does some logging of its own, right? So make sure that we're not logging these things, right? Make sure that those parameters don't get logged. Okay, that's one level of mitigation. But really, that doesn't fully solve the problem because a web server could have, done it, logged it before we had a chance to even see it. So really, to really uh, fix this, we really need to change the CAS protocol, right? To really, really make it secure, we really need to say, hey, I need to post those parameters instead of get it, using them as, as uh, query parameters in the get. Okay, so this is a sample, uh, this is just an example of the kind of threat that you can get out of this kind of analysis. Um, in our experience in, in remediation, um, I think there's two categories of remediation. You could, there's probably more, but this is, these are two useful ones that, that, we, that I found. Um, I call them easy and harder. Of course, the easy ones aren't so easy, but the easy ones are basically security guy, right? Basically, things that you can do in documentation without actually changing the system to make sure that, you can, that a, a user that's deploying the system can deploy it in a secure way to mitigate those threats, okay? So as an example, um, uh, I mentioned before that you can have services that um, are accessible via HTTP and using CAS and they can have tickets being passed to them and those tickets can be stolen. Well, you can go into CAS and you can say, you know what, I'm not gonna let you do that. I'm not gonna hand you a ticket if you're an HTTP endpoint. I'm just not gonna give you a ticket. Um, and you can do that. There's, you know, you go into the CAS configuration and you disable HTTP. Um, that's something that's easy to put in a security guide. Um, something else that happened, we were actually at the same conference um, somebody was uh, giving a discussion about how they had implemented a CAS um, agent or plugin, a client. And when they discussed how they did it, it turned out that they actually uh, made a, a very easy to make mistake in the implementation of their, of their uh, CAS client. It was a CAS client for a Node.js. They made a very simple mistake in the implementation, one that, that um, is very easy to run into. We've, we've got it documented, you know, don't make this mistake, but the mistake is very easy to make. Um, and they made the mistake and we, you know, we went over and talked to him afterwards and he you know, went and fixed it. Um, but clearly, if that was written down in a security guide, right, and made very explicit so that the user has one place to go to make sure the thing is secure, that would have been much more effective. Um, another example is securing the registry, right? So there's a ticket registry, right? 
on that ticket registry is somebody's database or a cache or whatever, well, I don't control that. If I'm CAS, I don't control any of that code. I have to make sure that my adopter, when he adopts my project, right, knows that, you know, if you've got this ticket registry there, it's got sensitive information, information in it. You have to know that, you have to know that, and you have to make sure that you've secured your registry. Okay? That's another thing that you can get out of a security guy. That's also something you can get out of the threat analysis. Because if I actually look at my data flow diagrams, I can see, hey, there's a call out to this external process that I don't control. And if you don't, if you as an adopter don't secure that thing, the system's not secure. Um, the harder things are to change, you know, change the code. So one of the big things is, you know, secure by default. Um, you know, on the one hand, you think, well, that's not that hard to change, but of course, any change is, any change is difficult. It can introduce incompatibilities and what have you. But those, secure by default is like, I think one of the things, themes that came up was there was a lot of places where, again, you could turn on CAS kind of in an insecure way. It wasn't the CAS is insecure, it's just that it's easy to turn it on in an insecure way. Um, uh, so that's one, one kind of harder change. You have to change the code, but that's a category of things that I think are worthwhile to look at if you're doing threat analysis. Um, another thing that we, we talked about, we just talked about the, the ticket registry. What if I say, you know what, I don't believe that my customer is going to secure the ticket registry properly. What can I do about that? Well, I could encrypt or, and sign the ticket registry. Then I don't have to worry about that anymore. Then even if his database is wide open, hypothetically, if, if my encryption keys are secure, my, my system is secure. Again, that's something you get out of threat analysis. You say, you know what? There's a threat here. I come up with a list of mitigations, and then I see, you know, categorize them in, in one category or the other. Um, so the results, what results do we have? Um, we, we classified um, 19 threats against the system. Uh, we generated about 10 proposals for um, changing, making changes, either adding stuff to the security guide or improving the security of the, of the project. Um, one proposal, that one secure by default proposal that we talked about, um, basically um, disabling uh, uh, proxying by default, um, is actually integrated into the next version of CAS. So we actually had some concrete, um, besides the artifacts that we share, that we, that we produce, that can be just read online, we actually did actually um, get something into code. And I'd say a paraphrase from one of the CAS committers was, you know, basically, I started off with, you know, people said, oh, there's probably nothing there. One of the cast members said, you know what, I didn't think we were going to find any problems. We really did find things. So it was, you know, was, we have some evidence that was a useful exercise. Um, so challenges, we're almost, we'll get to the end here. So challenges that we had. Um, even a security project like CAS, uh, features get favored over security. Um, so people are interested in, hey, I want to make sure that I can integrate into some other system or, you know, I can deploy it in, in, on this language or that language. And they tend not to look at the things that have been, you know, were code that was written five years ago that might have problems with it, right? They're always looking at the new stuff. Um, it's just difficult to get co um, consistent participation, although um, the, the folks here are actually uh, doing a pretty good job. You know, we all have day jobs, but we're taking the time to do it uh, once a week. I think the once every two weeks kind of works out. If you can even, even getting once or two, uh, once out of two weeks on, on something like this, you actually make a lot of progress. Um, so I thank my co-presenters and Jerome, who was a committer who, who joins us every couple of weeks. He's in France, so he couldn't come here. Um, you know, of course, and then once you do you recommend changes, you've got to get them into the project. It's difficult to get them um, scheduled in, and you've got to put priority on them. Okay, I think we're getting to the end, right? So basically, I don't know if uh, we wanted to, to end. Basically, the, uh, the call here was basically to say that, um, you know, we did this basically based on volunteering, right? None of us are, um, I'm not getting paid to do this. Um, but uh, by doing this, this is a project that we, you know, we depend on. Um, if you're interested in, in making sure that uh, these kinds of projects have uh, better security, well, there's an easy way to do it. Find a project, go look at, go look at it, try to get it, try to get started, you know, one of these uh, working groups started, an application security working group, or just go find some security bugs in the, in the tracking list and go quash them, whatever it is that, uh, you know, you feel you can contribute, right? I mean, these open source projects, they're not going to become secure magically by themselves, right? So if the experts don't um, put the effort in to do it, no one, you know, no one else is going to. Um, I think that's it. So um, thank you very much. We can uh, we can take questions or sure. Sure.
Evet. Okay. So, so the, the question is, okay, so the question is, um, uh, it, it, so you, ma okay, you made a couple comments there. The question was, why would I want to draw a data flow diagram? I've got all these other architectural diagrams with, you know, kind of some richer information. Um, so uh, I'm not particular about saying it has to be a data flow diagram. I mean, that's the way that um, at Microsoft and others in the industry that uh, do these things. Um, I think that if you have too much detail, of course, that's also bad, right? I mean, you need to get to the level of abstraction where you can actually identify the attack services, right? So it may not be important. The exact deployment might or might not be important to doing this analysis, right? Um, I think the point here is that a lot of times you don't have the right diagrams to be able to do the systematic identification of attack services. If you've got another diagram that you can use to do that, I mean, my personal thing would be I would take the other diagrams that are very complicated and actually reduce them in complexity so that I can do this analysis properly, right? And I've got this thing that, it, that talks about, you know, deployment and has use case diagrams and a hundred other things and compo internal components and classes. That's just going to distract from this kind of analysis. So am I asserting that you have to redo all your diagrams to get started with this? No, if you've already got a diagram on which you can look at and say, you know what, I can take the stride, right, or one of these models and apply it to that, yeah, I think that's fantastic. I do think, though, that the level of abstraction is the, in my experience so far, this is the right level of abstraction. You do get to identify where the attack surface is a little bit better than you would with some diagram that has a lot of other details that you don't need. So my intuition would be take those other diagrams and simplify them into something like this, and then start the analysis, but, you know, obviously that's just a, you know. Yes. I'm okay. No, 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 no. That, well, the, okay, so you, I think you said, okay, look, the question was, why would you bother with stride? What the developers need is this more, more um, detailed threat analysis, right? No, but, but, uh, yeah, so there. Well, I think, so the stride categor categorization um, is really, from my point of view, it's to help the person that's doing the threat analysis. Right. If it's, the, I don't know who you're, who the develop. You said it doesn't help the developers. I don't know who the developer is that you're talking about. But the point is that if I don't have some systematic way, and it doesn't have to be stride, it could be something else, right? If I don't have some systematic way of thinking about all the possible threats at this location, I'm going to miss things, right? So this is just a way of. I mean, stride is just a high level way to me, a high level way of looking at. Did I remember to look at integrity? Did I remember to look at every aspect of the system? That could every aspect of this. Um, attack surface that could be attacked in order to figure out whether or not I missed something. Obviously, when, once, you're, once you're actually done the analysis, the output is going to be something that looks something to, similar to what I've got on the board right there. Right? It's not going to look like this. So, if it, again, if, it doesn't, if this is not the thing that helps you, and there are much more detailed, there are much more detailed um, threat libraries that you can find, right? especially for web applications. You can find, yeah, go ahead. Okay. I think, I think those are, I think, you know, those are more specific ones that are dealing with specific kinds of interfaces. And I, I don't disagree. I mean, I don't disagree. I mean, it's a question of, I mean, 
Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I was, I said, we happen to use Stride. The point is, you want to do something systematic, though. You don't want to just, you don't want to just start, like I said, staring at the ceiling, staring at your navel, trying to figure out what, what things might be relevant. You want to have some list that you're looking at. This is a list that we use, but I, I agree with you. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, whatever list is useful here. Yeah. Okay, uh, other questions? Okay, thank you very much.